I'll grab that. As long as they're close to the speaker, I'll turn that. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, <coughs> good. <coughs> the acoustics in here is maybe not perfect, but I like being in a lab, though. I like, I, I really like the idea that all the courses are taught in a lab, because this is a lab. So I want to teach fundamentals, fundamental physics, fundamental mathematics. So what's in this course, it might seem easy. A lot of people say, oh, this is a really easy course. You know, it's just you're teaching really basic stuff here. But what I think is, 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 is really important is that we learn the really fundamental things, the foundation upon which all of these things are built, because so much of our education is missing that. That's what I found at MIT, is MIT taught me how to, how to learn and how to teach at a fundamental level. So I'm going to start by teaching what is a camera, because cameras are beautiful, because it's a technology that merges the physical and the virtual world. You've got the physical world of atoms, and you've got the virtual world of bits, and the camera is one of the technologies that merges atoms and bits together. As soon as you put a camera on your computer, it connects it to the real physical world. The computer becomes responsive to its environment. We all know what environment is, right? Environment means that which surrounds us, the environment, and our surroundings. And of course, the environment is us ourselves, you know, and around us. And of course, the boundary between the environment and the environment is the technology. I call that the environment, the boundary between us and our surroundings. Examples of environments include clothing, shoes, cars, buildings, cities, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> so these are technologies that encompass or enclose us and, and, and sort of partition us between us and what surrounds us. And so, environmentalism is another name for this field of research. Mersivity is another name. Mersivity is technology that if you can merse it, if it can merse you, you can merse it. If it's immersive, it kind of encloses you in. You can also merse it, you can enclose it into your environment. And, and so, <clears throat> a good example of, of this kind of technology is these things that allow you to explore and experience the world around you. Um, so there's a, this is, is called the smart swim. This is one of my favorite examples, is it's an eyeglass that you can swim with it. And so it, it keeps you in touch with reality. It doesn't disconnect you from nature. So much of technology disconnects us from nature. But this is a technology that connects us to nature. This, is, this box is just empty. There's not a smart swim in here. I'll pass this around so you can get a close look at it. But I do have these if you want to sign out. If there's anybody here who likes to program Android and wants to sign out one of these eyeglasses, Smart Swim, for example. Feel free to grab me after class. We can go back to my lab. I have an office hour at the end of every class. So if you need help, I've got three office hours every week. And the office hours are Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, 3 p.m., right after class. So just grab me an office hour, and we can go back to my lab and sign one of these out if, 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 if you want. I'll pass this around so you can see sort of what what it, it, it looks like. And then the other thing I can pass around, there's another product called the Vuzix Blade. Uh, this is not for use in water. It's not waterproof. But I've got one here taken apart so you can see what's in it. And so this is an eyeglass. This is a smart swim taken apart. Actually, uh, catch that one up with the smart swim. That's the smart swim taken apart. You can see what's in there. Here's the other piece of it. Pass that one around with it. That's the computer, and the other piece is the display. And it's all waterproof. You can see how is designed for use underwater, so it connects you to your environment. It doesn't disconnect you from your environment. This is an eyeglass, and it has concealed inside it. It has a, a, a display device. You wouldn't even know it looking at it. It just looks totally like normal eyeglasses. But inside this eyeglass is completely concealed are a number of cameras and display media so that the eyeglass is connected. It looks just like ordinary eyeglasses, but when you're wearing it, it can modify, it can help you see better, it can function as a seeing aid, and it can, can connect you to the environment, to the, to the world around you. And instead of technologies that disconnect you or take you away from your environment, we have technologies that bring you towards your environment. I'll pass this around so that you can see it's all taken apart, but there's the camera there, the display, the Aramac, and it's a matter of connecting and engaging with the world that is around you. Um, I'll just show a, a, a quick example. I'm part of a group called Swim OP, Swim at Ontario Place. 
a Sunday snowstorm. There, this is a shot from my eyeglass. Um, so I'm in the water swimming, and uh, it's a 4K 60p video feed, and it, it streams alive on my head-up display. I can see where there's any rocks or hazards, so I know if there's anything around me that might be dangerous. So I can see where the rocks and patterns are. When I swim to the Toronto Island uh, from, from Michael Hoff Beach, I can know where all the hazards and the buoys are, where the airport exclusion zone is, and everything's showing up on my head-up display. But I'm in the real world. It's not like you're sitting there with a phone looking at something like this. You know, we didn't, we weren't meant as humans to walk around like this and oh, bump into stuff. And you know, like you you see all these people there like this and they fall into a pothole or something while they're walking around looking at this thing. It disconnects you from the environment. It doesn't actually connect you to the environment. It makes your life worse, not better. So I want to build technologies that advance humanity and 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 everyone. Uh, and this. This is, a, 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 this is from Sunday, um, so even, uh, uh, you're inside my head looking at the world. So as I'm, as I'm uh, walking down to the lake, you can see, uh, it, it's like when you, the video's on YouTube, you can take a look at it, but, but it, it's kind of like you're inside my head. Um, and uh, of course she also shot some video of me as well too. So you've got this, this beautiful um, world, if you will, where, And then there's, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see that as well, too. I'll try to get a shot with everybody in. I'll skip ahead till I get in there. One more? No. <laughs> so it's fun, you know, you're, you're, you're connected to the world, it connects you to nature, it makes you become one with the natural world around you. And, and so rather than cut us off or isolate us from the outside world, so this is kind of what I mean by environmentalism or immersivity, immersive, submersive, remersive technology. And so that's kind of in the spirit of immersivity. A related term is XR, extended reality. This is something Charles Wyckoff and I invented at MIT in 1991. Uh, extended reality is a catch-all term to refer to augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and all the other realities. The term was introduced in 1991 and is specifically defined as a unifying concept to interpolate between the realities and extrapolate beyond them. Uh, so if, if you look here, this is the, the paper that I wrote with uh, the president of the IEEE Standards Association and, and uh, some various other people. It's in the IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine. So if you look at that, and then there's also the 1991 paper I wrote with Charles Wyckoff, which is, um, my website is wherecam.org, and that particular paper, if you're interested, is xr.htm, and this is this 1991 where we had first introduced the concept of XR at MIT. So uh, that's kind of one very important part of the, the course, is wearable AI, wearable vision, personal AI, like AI, it's not AI co-pilot in the Microsoft sense. It's not, uh, we don't really see the AI as, 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 as like a co-conspirator. It's really, it's you, you know, and the, the, the environmentalism is the right philosophy to think of this because it's AI and all this technology should be environment. It should be something that becomes part of you, not another being or another entity. And so that's really the spirit of immersivity. It's built on this principle of humanistic intelligence. We've got the three elements. We've got the physical world of atoms, the virtual world of bits, and the social world of genes. Atoms, bits, and genes. By the way, atom is a Greek word. It means not divisible. It starts with the letter alpha in Greek. And uh, actually, we now know there's subatomic particles and everything, but it's a poetic merit metaphor. It's not meant to be like exactly precise. You know, when at, at MIT, when we say atoms and bits, we're speaking kind of figuratively, because obviously there's quarks and pi mesons and subatomic particles included as well. And uh, so atoms is the physical world alpha, bits is the virtual world beta, and genes is the social world gamma. Genes is, is a Greek word also, and it starts with the third letter of the Greek alphabet, gamma. So we've got alpha, beta, gamma, the first three letters of the Greek alphabet representing the physical, the virtual, and the social. 
And you see, when you put a camera on something, it makes it necessarily physical and social. Because if a computer's just doing AI, it's one thing, it's all in its own little box. But as soon as you put a camera on it, it can now see, it's connected to the real world. So it definitely now is part of the physical world. It's not just virtual anymore. I've got the computer screen here with the traditional green glow of the computer screen or the oscilloscope represents the virtual world. And suddenly now it's connected to the physical because now it's got a camera on it. But it's also social too, because you see, as soon as you have a camera on it, it becomes social. You know, I swam over to the West Island and when, it, when they closed it off for a, a concert and I got up onto the beach and I got the CEO came running over to me and said, you oh, know, start yelling at me, you're not allowed to be here, what are you doing? This place is closed. And uh, of course I know under maritime law, you know, you're allowed to land on a beach and it's the safest thing to do when you're swimming is to land somewhere, rest for a little while and continue your swim. And so, uh, but when she saw that I was wearing a camera, she suddenly became very, very nice and polite. And it's really interesting how the camera is a social machine. It uh, evokes responses, you know, like a lot of people say, hey, are you recording me? And I say, well, you know, there's surveillance. You've got cameras watching us all over. What's a little surveillance? I, I get this at grocery stores. Hey, you're not allowed to take pictures here. And, uh, you know, I say, well, this is how I see. You know, I've been seeing this way. It's, it's my seeing aid and it's the way I understand the world. And if you ask me to take it off or something and I trip and fall, I'm going to have to, you're going to have to be responsible for it. And, you know, it's all kinds of fun things. It definitely becomes social. When, <clears throat> whenever you put a camera on something, it makes it a discussion of privacy, security, trust, law, governance, all these human things. So it definitely throws some gamma onto it. So you take this AI and you add a camera and now all of a sudden it's mercivity. It's, it's not just bits, it's atoms and genes as well. And so that's kind of what we're going to get to in this course. Fundamental concepts of like, what is a camera after all? So of course you'll, 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 you'll see and you'll learn that, that HI, we call it humanistic intelligence, that's another name for it. HI is humanistic intelligence. And uh, let me just go up 11, so you see it here. Yeah, HI is humanistic intelligence, has six fundamental properties. Humanistic intelligence, it's unmonopolizing, like, like I can climb a ladder, I can climb a rope, I can swim while I've got this uh, technology. And, and so it, it, it's, not, it's not monopolizing my intention, like I, it's not blocking me from seeing the world or whatever, I can still negotiate the world. And if I'm driving a car and it's using the technology, I can still see the road, you know, it's not blocking me from seeing the road. And it's unrestrictive in the sense that it doesn't uh, restrict me. Like, like if I'm holding onto my smartphone, I can't climb a rope and look at a smartphone at the same time. I, I can't safely drive a car and look at a smartphone at the same time holding it in my hand, you know. So, or a bicycle, you know, where you, gotta, you really want both hands on the handlebars when you hit a pothole or a rock. You know, if you sit there with your phone in one hand and you hold the handlebar on another hand, you're, you're going to kiss the pavement pretty soon because you're going to hit a rock and go flying. Uh, so that's really important and then it's observable and controllable these these are, are two other properties of technology if it's watching you you should be able to watch it surveillance and surveillance these are called observability and controllability if the technology is watching us we should also be able to watch it we should know what it's doing and understand it and then it, it, the technology is attentive to its surroundings and it's communicative to the world around it so those are examples of, te of, of technologies that meet those six fundamental flow paths so this course is really built around labs. You're going, we're really going to focus on labs in this course. That's how you're gonna learn. And I'm here for every lab. It's not like I'm not send, just sending TAs in to do the labs. I'm gonna actually be here because I'm doing the labs and I value the student experience. As far as I'm concerned, my highest priority, of course, is my wife and children. If they need something, they're there. But you guys are next after that. Nothing else is higher of priority than you guys other than my wife and kids. So if you need something, let me know. If you need help with something, let me know. If you need, need help building something or making something, let me know. So that's what this course is about. It's about teaching you how to make and build things. And it's about me being here and putting in some quality time with the students and doing the labs and teaching you fundamentals. The very, very first lab, I want you all to make a camera because I want it to be very simply understanding. The first lab's quite easy, actually. My children can, did it like when they were in high school, very, very easy. Um, and <clears throat> uh, But it's gonna open your eyes to how things actually work because so much of AI doesn't teach us the fundamentals. 
like learning AI without learning measure theory and Lebesgue integration is like building a big skyscraper that has no foundation. So we want to first understand what a camera is. So I'm, I've got some very easy labs that really understand fundamentally, but I want you to think deeply about it. So the first lab, you're going to build a camera. So you're going to build a, bring a box on Thursday. This Thursday, the first lab starts at noon in this room. I've been very careful to make sure that all the classes and labs are in the same room right here. So it's in the same place. It's going to be familiar to you. I've got blackout cards and cardboard to put over the windows if we need it to be dark in here. Uh, we've got all the equipment we need. Everything's all set. So come in with an empty cardboard box, some scissors, tape, you know, whatever you can make, and I'll show you how to make a camera right here. And I've got the cap capable TA here, two very capable TAs, one of them meta here, and then the other TA uh, will also be here as well on Thursday. And we'll show you how to make a box camera. You're going to make a camera and understand how a camera works. And so uh, I've got here a camera. This more than 100 years old. Um, and in the old days, cameras were simple and easy to understand. And so I want to show everybody how a camera works. And so at the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you all how that camera works. I've got a light set up here, and I want to show you how it works. The next lab, this lab two, is building a one pixel camera. You're going to build a camera that only has one pixel in it. So you're going to have to force you to, it'll force us to think about what is a pixel, what is a camera, what does a camera measure? When I invented HDR in the 1980s, and then I took this invention out to MIT in 1991, uh, it was a revolutionary idea. I said being undigital is what I called that early paper. I said I want to make undigital photography. I want to use computers to be undigital, to get rid of quantization and digital artifacts and get images that are essentially analog and continuous by way of collecting multiple differently exposed images of the same subject matter and cementing them together. And so what I did is determined exactly how much light was coming in from each direction in space. So photoquantographic. And quantographic <coughs> sensing or quantographic imaging, that's what HDR is. Comparometric equations is the kind of mathematics I invented for comparometrics for HDR. And one of my students and I came up with an important link between quantum field theory and comparometric equations. So we actually were able to solve comparometric equations by converting them to ordinary differential equations. So you convert a comparometric equation to an ODE, and this foundation behind HDR is really fascinating in that sense. So if you do get a chance to read, uh, there's obviously my textbook, which obviously goes through it. <coughs> but there's this other HDR video book as well. And, and they asked me to write, to write chapter one, which is the introduction to HDR. As the inventor of HDR, they wanted me to write sort of the foundational chapter to open the concept. And so HDR is used in, in more than 2 billion smartphones now. It's used in just about every smartphone, just about every commercially made camera. When you take a picture, often HDR is on by default. When you take a picture now, it's not really one picture. It's a whole bunch of pictures that are all cemented together using comparometric equations and, and, and uh, combining the images together. So uh, that's, that's kind of important to look at AI and, and machine learning and vision from that point of view. So this lab two will be the, one, the building a one pixel camera. It's going to force you to say, what is a pixel and what does it measure? Because I used to see pictures as an array of numbers. And, and nobody asked the question, what the numbers mean? They spatially filter them, do a edge detection algorithm, or spatial derivatives, and the Horn and Shunk equations, brightness change constraint equation, all that stuff, fundamental matrix, essential matrix, all that Olivier Fogera, uh, um, all, 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 all these different things, Berthold Horn, all, all the stuff people did with images was spatial. But what I did is I said, if you have one pixel only, you can't do any spatial calculations. Now we've got to actually explain to me what that one pixel is and what it means. So it's really easy to build a one pixel camera. You just need a photo cell. But when you do that, it's going to force you to ask a fundamental question of what is that pixel and what is it measuring? And then the next lab I want to introduce is displays. So I'm going to make a very elementary display. You guys are going to build a really simple display. And it's just a row of pixels, not just one pixel, but a row of pixels, not a two-dimensional array, just a linear array of pixels. And so I, I, I built this, uh, and this kind of started when, in my childhood. 
I, I used to take TV sets and turn them into oscilloscopes, so I got the electron beam of the cathode ray to put a dot on the screen and it deflected it with signals of my own choice, disconnected, because I didn't really like watching the garbage that was on TV. So I'd get TVs people were throwing away and turn them into oscilloscopes so that <coughs> I could tune into a local channel, namely some mathematical or physics phenomena that I wanted to look at. And <coughs> of course these TVs didn't like being modified and sometimes they'd overheat and smoke would come out of them and stuff. So my dad finally got me an actual real cathode ray oscillograph when I was 12 years old. I was working electron beam, <coughs> I was working and, 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 but the dot only went up and down, the time base didn't work and I got impatient and wanted to see it so I started pushing it back and forth. On, I put it on a little set of Rolex. Back in the day we used to do what's called sidewalk surfing. It's called skateboarding now, but back in the day it was called sidewalk surfing. And we'd take wheels from roller skates and mount them on a piece of plywood or something and roll down the sidewalk on them. And and uh, you couldn't buy skateboards then. Uh, you had to make them. And uh, um, then I put, I had this thing with wheels, so I put my oscilloscope on it, start whipping it back and forth like this. And I said, oh, that's really cool. I can see stuff. So I, I called it a scientific instrument because rather than sitting inside the box and looking at this little CRT in the box, the whole CRT was moving back and forth and painting out an image on my in a dark room. Of course, if you let your eyes adjust, you can see this phenomenon. And so I realized that I can see things. And, and uh, uh, what I invented was, it, I called it metavision or metavalence, the sensing of sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. And now, uh, uh, a lot of people recognize that as the predecessor of the metaverse, the, the sort of early work I did in the 70s. <clears throat> I built a, a, a row of lights back in the 70s. Also, I invented, designed, and built the world's first addressable strip of lights, first incandescent, and then I built the world's first address strip of addressable LEDs, the world's first addressable LED strip in the, <coughs> in the 19... 70s and um, so this this is a uh, I like to build little smartphones for fun and this is thing allows me to see the electromagnetic radio waves coming from the phone so you can see the waves are stronger when they're closer and weaker when they're further away and if I go kill those lights there a little bit I'll just turn down turn off some of the lights in here actually I can probably get rid of them all because there's enough light in here now if I I'll just come around so each of you can see it and uh, observe this phenomenon. You see if I go like this, you can see the electromagnetic radio wave and if I go through the stack of books here, you can see that the wave is weaker going through the books, right, because the books attenuate some of that. Can everybody see that? I'll run around so everybody can get a close-up view of it so you can see as I move this swim back and forth, I call it the sequential wave and printing machine. You can see that. As I move it back and forth, you can see the electromagnetic radio waves uh, coming from this smartphone. And you can see that the waves are stronger when I'm closer to the smartphone and weaker when I'm further away. Try not to let your eyes fall on my hand. Just look, stare up into space, and you'll be able to see the waveform there. You can see that waveform. And what's really magical about this, or wonderful about it, is if I move slowly, the wave bobs up and down slowly. Right? And if I move a little faster, the wave bobs up and down a little faster. And if I move medium fast, it goes up and down medium fast. So when I move forwards, it goes forwards. And I move backwards, it goes backwards. And it, it has a frame rate of about maybe millions of frames per second. So it responds within less than a millionth of a second. Not like a, a computer display that only updates 60 times a second or something like that. This updates millions of times a second at the speed of light, really. And so this is physics. And, 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 and I, call this, I call this the sequential wave and printing machine, the SWIM, S-W-I-M. And it, it allowed me to see and understand physical phenomenology. Uh, and, and we call this mediated reality, computer-mediated reality, generated reality. And so I put three of these on a motor, and uh, I got three of them on this, this motor. I'll hold it over here so people on this side can see it, and then I'll move it over there so people on that side can see it. But I've got this motor here, and I've got three of these on a motor, red, green, and blue, and one of them's connected to each of the three phases of the motor. And there now you can see the three phase, you can see the rotating magnetic field inside the motor. 
I'll bring it over to the other side so that everybody over here can see it. Actually, I can probably, you know, you, can, you guys can all see that, right? So you can see that rotating electromagnetic field in the motor from the sequential wave and printing machine. And this is, I guess I call it real reality, maybe would be a good name for it. It's, it's the phenomena, the, 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 the reality phenomenon. And I'll have that here after class if people want to stay and play around with it. How many people here build stuff? How many people here have a workshop at home and make things at home? Anyone? Does anybody build things? Now, anybody have an Arduino of their own, not part of a class, just your own? Yeah, that's pretty good. Anybody got a soldering iron? That's not bad. You have some people. Anybody have their own voltmeter at home? That's not bad. It shows that you kind of you, you, you play, have some fun, build things, you know, that kind of stuff is, is good. So what we'll learn in this course is, is, is how to make things, how to build things, how to understand things. And so that's kind of what I want to emphasize. So if you, if you have friends who are into this kind of stuff, like to make things or build things, Tell them about this course because it'll be good. We'll get a little bit of meta-mentorship going. I like to teach by what I call meta-mentorship, mentoring mentors. So the way this course can really work well is if there's a few people in the course who, who are really quite skilled at making, I can teach and inspire and those people to help teach and inspire the rest of the class because then you get help from your peer group. You, so you want to, like, you form together. So we've got a Discord server set up and, you know, we're going to, create and facilitate uh, interaction among the students so that you guys can teach each other, you can learn, you can form study groups and stuff like that and grab onto some of this cool technology and, and, and really work on it. Your lab, the labs are going to be done in groups of two. The first lab will probably be individual because you're still getting to know each other. So usually the first lab, everybody just builds a box camera because that's really easy. And then the second lab, when you do the, 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 the photo cell, uh, that will be groups of two. And then the third lab, you're going to be doing displays. So the first lab, we're going to, you'll learn what a camera is. Second lab, you're going to learn what a, a camera measures. And the third lab, you're going to learn what a display is. And the very simplest display, which I built when I was 12 years old, out of scrap materials people were throwing away. No, no budget. I had a zero budget. And I just built uh, what people call augmented reality, or really extended reality is the right term for it. And and uh, it was simple. This is this very simple thing that you can move. It's just a one-dimensional row of pixels. Very, very easy to build. So I, I, I've got a lab kit that will be made available. So you can get these materials for the lab from any, just about any place like Amazon or AliExpress or anything like that. I've got a, a lab kit which I'll make available just at cost, really. We're not gonna really making any money off it, but if you guys want to, to be able to, I'll, I'll have the kit available where you can just, just order the, you know, pick up the kit. Uh, we'll have a, a number of them in inventory so that, you know, you can buy a simple kit to play and tinker and build uh, one of these sequential wave and printing machines, for example. And the, the way the kit is set up, it's a one meter long swim. We've got a one meter strip of addressable LEDs as part of the kit. And the, the it's joined in the middle so that as a, you can buy, as a lab partner, you guys can buy one kit <coughs> and split it up because it's really easy to separate the swim. It can be separated in the middle so you can each have a half meter. So you can decide if you live close to each other and, and you're in easy reach, then you just keep it as a one meter strip, perhaps if you wish. Or if you live, one of you lives in Markham and the other lives in Etobicoke and you have trouble getting together, you can, disc it, you can unsolder it and make it into two half meter strips. So you can each take one. And so <coughs> that'll allow a lab uh, groups of two to, to function productively and efficiently. And so what you'll do is you'll learn with a SWIM, sequential wave and printing machine, how to understand phenomena. And you'll understand the history of augmented reality and virtual reality and, and extended reality, how it all came about. And you'll sort of retrace some of the steps. Uh, I'll teach you some of the steps of, of how this, these ideas came in my childhood and how to redo it. Because if you go back to the fundamentals, it's really easy to understand. Um, so I can explain this to any 12-year-old child with limited mathematical skill. I can explain how this works 
and it's very simple. I, I took these swims to, to uh, the school, you know, when my kids were in school, I would take it in when they were in grade six or whatever, take it into the school, and everybody understood it. And it, it's really nice because it's simple. You don't start to understand the fundamentals, you'll understand it in a really natural way. And then when you start adding these other layers of how the displays work, how the head-mounted displays, how the eyeglasses work, you'll, you'll be able to deeply understand and, and grab onto it right away. So that's, I think, going to really be powerful and, 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 and helpful. So the way this course works is there's a, a I want to see some participation. Oh, I should, the screen saver just kicked in. I should, I want to see some participation. We have about eight minutes left. Um, so the course is wherecam.org slash ECE516. There's a link from Quercus. <coughs> so I don't really like uh, modern software that's badly written. Um, so we prefer to write our own. Our, uh, TA here, he writes his own learning management systems and he started a company doing LMS. So we've got a lot of things that are much better than Quercus that we can write ourselves. So we're probably not going to use Quercus that much. Um, but. Uh, but in any case, uh, you check the, the, the site here, it'll give you an idea. You'll have the labs and the, I want to see some participation. I, I, I kind of like to, to, to have a, a, a little bit of the grading, you know, is, is participation. I want to see everybody here, the, the TA, you know, I, I expect you to show up. It's okay if you do have a conflict, let me know and we'll figure out how to deal with that. But, uh, but let me know if you've got some kind of conflict with another course or something or there's anything else and, and we'll work around it. But, but by and large, I, 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 I kind of want to see people coming here, engaging, interacting, and benefiting from the experience here. So there's, there's some component of, of participation in the classes and, and of course the labs. So the labs are, the first lab, because it's so soon, because it's Thursday, it's going to be really easy, and you just come and bring a box, and we'll show you how to make it, and then you're going to post to Instructables the following week. But as we get moving along, uh, we'll, we'll want to, the labs are not necessarily difficult, but they, the, you, you've got to do something and show it. So that's, that's kind of what, what I want to see is, is a fundamental understanding of, of how these things work. So the way the pe web page is organized, you can familiarize yourself with it. Home is ECE 516 in, in blue here. So schedule is right here. And so you can tell I like ASCII art and simplicity. So this website will work on any browser no matter what. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, design wise I don't like stacking stuff left to right, you know, so you can zoom in or out of the web page. If I go control minus and you go right down to here, it's perfect, it's just a two dimensional array of stuff and it's, as I zoom in, it works gracefully anywhere from 25% to 600% magnification. Unlike many other web pages that break up or do weird things when you zoom into them. So for people with visual impairment or such, it works good. It, for blind, anyone who is blind or low vision, it also works beautifully with a text browser. Just point any text browser to it and it works. Because the way I wrote it is the same as pages were made in 1993. I had the world's first uh, photo sharing site in 1993 and uh, very simple. And so I'm keeping the simplicity there so that it's universally accessible to anyone of any ability or any operating system or anything else. And I, I prefer uh, free open source, obviously. Uh, labs, uh, and this is, this, this is a series of photographs of an ITAP, and these photographs show what's known as metavalence or metavision, the sensing of sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. So these are photographs of the camera's ability to see. And, <coughs> and so this, you'll learn, you'll understand what metavalence is and meta, metaval metavalogrammetry and metavalography. And <coughs> so the labs, uh, it, it's going to give you, and uh, we'll revamp them every year. So if you guys have ideas you want in the labs, I can morph or, or modify the labs as we go. The first lab is definitely going to be making a pinhole camera. It's and you post it to instructables.com as how you put it out. There's a there's the philosophy of the course, which is this interplay between mind and body, uh, and interplay between the environment. With if you think of this, the mind and body are interconnected, and so the human 
uh, being is also connected to its environment and it's uh, almost a fractal self-similar nature. Opportunities, that's my student Ryan Jansen. While he was my student, he raised $75 million and started a transportation company. And then when he graduated, he raised another $500 million. This is pretty good. And so I've had a number of students who've been successful. I've managed to get quite a few students into MIT and Stanford and starting companies. And uh, one of my other students and I, uh, Chris Amini, uh, he, he was the top student in Engsai, uh, was Jason Sears, him and, and Sears. And the two of them built that window washing robot with suction cups that climbs up buildings as they're in their inch side. And then uh, Chris and I, and, and we got uh, Jason into MIT, and, and Chris and I founded a, a company called Interaxon together with some other people. And we make the world's leading brain sensing headband, which and we're still in business all through COVID. And that's this product here. And I've got lots of these if people want to sign them out as well, too, if you want to try brain sensing headband and do some sort of fundamental AI, humanistic intelligence, humanistic AI. So you got opportunities. And this is the history uh, of, of the site. There's a nice 20 year long history. You can kind of go way back and look at what the lab, what, what it was like before. And then if you want to go to the home page, just click in the upper left ECE 516. So that's the metavalence flux and so on. And uh, there's the TAs, meta, and Yun Tao, Tony, Kai. And the syllabus for last year is up there. I'm working on the syllabus now. And if you got any ideas of stuff you want in the syllabus, let me know. Um, this is uh, kind of the early discovery. This is when I had my oscilloscope and I was moving it back and forth, so repeating my experiment from my childhood, which was. <laughs> to be able to see waveforms, uh, meta vision. There's a police radar on the left there, and this is a vision of vision that's sensing sensors and sensing their capacity to sense. Scientific instrument, thinking outside the box. The oscilloscope is a box, and the stuff's outside of it. And of course, it's copyleft, which is the opposite of copyright. And <coughs> uh, so that's kind of the general idea. Now, what I want to do before we close out, I want to give everybody a chance to look through this camera. So what I will do is I'll turn out the lights here a little dark, and I want to just show people. So this is a camera. It's very simple. Um, there's really nothing inside it. It's just an empty box. It's got these bellows on it so it can flex. There's a lens on the front, which is just a magnifying glass. And I'll set this lens down for a second. And then there's a piece of glass on the back. And the glass is ground so that, you know, it, it's frosty glass. So you can, like if I put my hand behind it, you can see my hand through it. But it's, it just shows the image. Now, what's inside this camera? What's inside a camera? Absolutely nothing. It's just an empty box. So, by the way, what does the word camera mean? Where does it originate from? Yeah, it, it's a, it, it means, so it's, a, it's an abbreviation. It was originally referred to as a camera obscura, which means dark room. The first cameras were large rooms that you'd go inside. And people used to go inside the camera. And you could see the image inside on the opposite wall. Here, uh, so a camera, means room and obscura means dark. So camera obscura means dark room. And so originally the camera was a dark room. Now, of course, the camera's got smaller like this and, and now you don't have to be inside the camera. So you just see the image on this glass. And now, of course, this glass can open up and you can put a, a, an image sensor like photographic film or, or I can also put an image sensor here and read it electrically. So if I put, put my image sensor in here, it just slides in here like this, and it's in the image plane. Of course, you can't see it anymore, so you have to look and frame up the shot and compose the shot and then slide the image sensor in to take the picture, or slide a piece of photographic film in to take the picture. So now, if I put the lens back on it, so that you see if I just put a piece of cardboard with a hole in there, you can understand if I just 
should have made a black heart and punch a hole in it, rays of light come in and land on the glass. So you'll see an image of what's there even just with the hole without a lens. Of course, with a lens, uh, you'll get a better result. And the lens has a shutter in it to open and close it so that it can open briefly to take a picture. Now, what you'll see now that I've got the lens in there, on there, and the glass will turn off the lights and you can come by on your way out, one at a time, come by and uh, take a look at the image on the back and just see, and, and you can have somebody sit up there and wave at you and you'll be able to see the person on the screen. So uh, let's, let's, let's finish off that way. We'll, we'll um, each of you can take a look at this on the way out, and then I'm here for the next, if you want to hang out and talk, uh, feel free to talk some more about anything course related or your plans in life, because we're trying to get a job done or you want to try to get into MIT or Stanford or whatever advice you need, I'll be here for the next hour or so to help. So I'm going to turn off the lights. Maybe what I'll do is I'll leave the lights on the back. And now it's dark enough in here that you can actually see. Now normally you pull a black cloth over your head, so if you have a black cloth, you know I always wear black because it's a, I'm a camera, you know, I am a camera in an existential sense, and cameras are usually black, so you don't affect the room. So I've always, since I was about 12 years old, I've wear only black. So we're at the time now for the class, so thank you everybody for participating, and on your way out, Take a look at the image here. You'll see on the screen. Meta, if you stand right in front of that, that light, go back up, stand up against the wall. Yeah. Now wave at me. So you can see him on the screen. Now let me put him into sharp focus. There he is. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so now, everybody take a look. Let me just wave at you and you'll see him just projected onto the screen on your way out. Yeah. Oh yeah, can you can you all introduce yourself before you go? Can you guys introduce yourself to Meta? Do you want to go around and Sure. Um, hey everyone, uh, we're gonna do attendance right here. Just if you're new to just